looking unto Jesus, centering or focusing on Him, His identity and ministry, as I have said over these last few weeks in some form or fashion or dimension or degree, has very intentionally been our theme for the past weeks, which now has turned into months. And today we're going to climactically conclude this specific season that we have taken in a series of proclamations that we have called Looking Unto Jesus. This week as I was preparing and meditating and praying, the word that kept coming to my mind was the word anticipation. It can be uh, integrated with expectation. In a very positive way, it integrates with hope. And what a great thought that is for us at this time in our history, but so incredible for us as new creations in Christ. Before me on the table is an incredible book by Dr. Tim LaHaye and our dear friend Tom I. It's called Charting the End Times. And one of the thoughts they expressed in there that I wanted to read for us today that integrates with this thought of hope is this. They say prophecy offers confident hope in a hopeless age. And we would agree that we do live in a hopeless age and time for those who are not in Christ in particular. Human beings can absorb many pressures in life, but a lack of hope is not one of them. The world in which we live has no hope. Prophecy students, however, not only know what our loving God has planned for the future of this planet, and the billions who live on it, but they also have a firm confidence toward the future and are not afraid. They not only know what the future holds, and this is such a critical thought, they also know who holds the future. Can we all say a hearty amen to that statement? And then they continue and they say these few thoughts. We who are Christians are confident that Jesus will come again. We are confident that he will come again because he promised he would. I thought about how when we had our drive-in service for Easter that we proclaimed he is risen. And then just as he said, and I thought about that in addition to here, is he is coming again, just as he said. Well, with that introduction, I just want to invite you to turn with me in the scriptures, whatever form you desire to use. And I did want to just emphasize this morning that we're turning in God's authoritative final revelation. It's inspired, it's infallible and errant in this day and age that has come under so much fierce attack. But it's a revelation of himself, of, of his desire and design, his will and his way. And in particular, his plan and his purpose for all men created in his image. And if you would turn to the New Testament, to the gospel according to John... And this morning, we're going to be flipping around to a lot of spots, or you can listen, whatever you would choose, but we're going to have a really great biblical journey. And we're going to consider a powerful, a pastoral proclamation that we're entitling, Looking Unto Jesus, the Coming Christ. And how today I do pray, as we always do, just for the powerful working of the Holy Spirit who Jesus has sent to empower us, to teach us, to illumine the revelation that he has given to us, not just so that we would be informed, but we would truly be transformed ever increasingly into the likeness of Christ. And I pray that God has been doing that and will continue doing that uh, today as we worship together through the proclamation of the Word of God. 
looking unto Jesus. We've proclaimed his deity very clearly, the eternality of him as the Son of God, as the Word, the second person of the Trinity, along with the Father and the Spirit. Also, in this journey, we've proclaimed his humanity, his first coming, his incarnation, his perfection, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, as well as his exaltation, his present session, him being at the right hand of the majestic glory, as we said last week, ever living to intercede for us, but also his earthly manifestation by the Holy Spirit, him indwelling, him living within us. And how I thank you for so many of the great encouragements I received from our proclamation last week. And that leads us from past ministry and <clears throat> present ministry to really a future ministry. Looking unto Jesus, the coming Christ. And we're just going to make two pastor's observations this morning. The coming of Christ really is in two movements from our perception here at Fellowship Chapel. The first one is this, His coming for us, the rapture of the church, we could say, or I love how Paul calls this incredible event in Titus 2.13, the blessed hope. John 14, verses 1 to 3. This is the classic and the first revelation uh, in regards to his return for his church. Look as I read John 14, verses 1 to 3. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place <clears throat> for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at that next phrase. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you will be also. This is a classic passage of an introduction to the rapture of the saints, where the Lord Jesus comes in the air to take his saints with him to heaven. Tell me that is not a great hopeful truth, that he himself has chosen to reveal and embedded an absolutely incredible uh, promise for us. We will highlight a few of those thoughts along with some other things in just a moment. But I want to give us some correlating scriptures that give us a little more depth as we move through the New Testament. If you want to turn with me, please go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Amazingly, <clears throat> most all of the books in the New Testament make reference to the second coming of Christ and in that both movements of his um, blessed hope coming for us in the air and us coming back with him at the glorious appearing. But the rapture of the church is mentioned, we know, at least 16 out of the 27 books, which is at least 60 percent, so a very high emphasis. And in 1 Thessalonians, really is a classic explanation that we use so many times at the homegoing of our dear brothers and sisters. And this is given to us for our hope and for our encouragement, even now as we run the race that God has set before us. Look in verse 13. This is what the apostle writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, uninformed, some translations say, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, or it could be rendered grieve as others who have 
And there we have that thought, who have no hope. And then this powerful thought in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, such an incredible integration, so wisely used by Paul and the Holy Spirit of really kind of slipping the gospel there, of believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and all that's revealed about Him. He says, even so, God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. And then verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Amazing, it's authoritatively given. That we who are alive and remain until... And then another powerful phrase, the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And then verse 16, for the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with a shout. I love that. This week I was thinking about that shout. You know, beloved ones, we may hear his voice. Isn't that something to think about? I've mentioned this, I think, one other time when I spoke on this passage. I wonder what that command will be. I kind of tend to think it will be come. And he's calling out all of those who are new creations in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on and says, with the voice of an archangel, the one archangel that we know that's mentioned is Michael. Isn't that a great name for the archangel? I, I just, I know, Mike. <laughs> I've often wanted to ask my mother, who's now with the Lord, and I never did, why did she name me Michael? It was probably because of that angelic face when she first held me. Don't y'all, can I get an amen to that? Or is there something that's opposite? <laughs> okay, I better proceed here. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and then the trumpet of God. Don't mistake this with trumpet calls in Revelation of judgments. This is like a trumpet call in Exodus for the people to gather and clear instruction and all of those types of thoughts. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be, look, caught up. That word means rapture, taken up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be, what an incredible thought here, always be with the Lord. What a future is ours based upon the very word of God and the promises that have been given to us. And then verse 18, therefore, in the light of all this truth, encourage or comfort one another with these words. I just love that thought that we have this incredible revelation of the rapture and the promise of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ forever with him. But the thought here that's embedded at the end is encourage one another as you run this race together. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, we really see a little bit more detail given to us on this new resurrection Body. I wanted to include this just because this is certainly a valuable part and is pointed to so much in regards to the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15 is an amazing a chapter. It really begins with such a clear presentation of the gospel, and then it moves on to thoughts of our glorious body and just some amazing things and even tied in with that is our final victory. And I want to pick up 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, something that was hidden in the past, but now it's revealed. And that's an incredible thing for us. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 
Not everyone is going to physically die, but we all will be changed. And verse 52, I love this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I don't think the twinkling of an eye can even be measured. I don't know who may be the scientific ones amongst us, but I've heard that said what it is. And it's, it's just amazing how fast and what that really means. And it goes on and says, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, which we referred to, and the dead will be raised, look what it says, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Isn't that incredible to consider those thoughts? So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But then in verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved ones, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And what an incredible future is ours. And I want to include verse 58 because just as in 1 Thessalonians, we had that incredible thought of an application of encouragement. Look what verse 58 says. Therefore, in the light of these incredible revealed truths, therefore, my beloved brethren, what? We said it earlier today. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What a great infusion of confidence and encouragement is ours in knowing and living in the light of these incredible truths. So the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for His church, the rapture of the church, we could say, the first movement in one sense of His second coming. There's some characteristics and qualities I just want to list here that we've seen. It's going to be personal. It's bodily, it's Him coming, it's His return in the air. It is imminent. It can occur at any moment or any time. It will be prior to the seven-year tribulation. We believe in a pre-tribulation return in the air of the Lord Jesus. There will be no signs and all the Christian saints will meet him in the air. This will, event will be for believers only. He will not physically return to the earth until the second coming, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And so many people confuse these events, but in viewing them with clarity, it just infuses us with incredible confidence. The saints will receive their glorified resurrection bodies. I know I'm going to have probably a head of hair that looks like a mane, and I can't wait for that. You're going to have to impress my face because you're not going to recognize me with that long hair. And as I've said before here, I'll just be able to throw it back like that. I can't wait for that day. <laughs> Incorruptible, immortal, sinless. The church, his bride, as Tim Canatella loves to call us, will be taken to the Father's house in heaven. Now tell me, isn't that great news? As we look unto him, and we have that just so embedded in us. There will be no judgment at that specific time on the earth. And a couple of other thoughts is it's a stealth event. 
It will be witnessed by believers only. We mentioned that in 1 Thessalonians. It will usher in a time of tribulation on the earth, and it will be a time of great joy, 1 Thessalonians says, for all believers. But there is one climactic thought that ties in with everything we've been talking about over these months. The climactic exclamation point is this. We will be forever with the Lord. We will be with Him. John 14, where I am, you will be with me. And 1 Thessalonians that we read, we will be forever with the Lord. Uh, tell me, isn't that incredible? Are you anticipating? Are you looking forward to that great moment in time? I just, I can't even have words for it of, of the anticipation and the expectation of that moment. Just a real quick encouragement for us. The pre-tribulational, pre-millennial return of Christ for His church, us, it is strengthening. It is encouraging. It grants us persevering, comforting, and purifying blessed hope. It is a no wonder that Peter would say, that as we sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, that we would be ready to give an account for the hope that is within us, right? We should just be exuding hope in a hopeless age. And it opens incredible doors for us to either say or just simply live the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a promise to be anticipated and to be fulfilled. Edward Henson, before we move to our next pastoral thought, he said in the light of the rapture of the church and that being a part of our end times uh, theology, he says, in the rapture, the church will be caught up and gathered together with her Lord. The church's future hope is the rapture. She awaits the Savior who is coming for her, his bride. Isn't that an incredible thought? Just as that woman would wait in the New Testament times, that bride-to-be for her husband to make that trek and to come for her, we the bride of Christ are waiting for his coming and for him to say, come, and for us to join him in the air and be with him forever. There's a second pastor's observation, and this is his coming with us, or actually us coming with him at his second coming physically to the earth. Paul calls this the glorious appearing in Titus 2.13. This was a thought so many are familiar with. And I just wanted to give us a really quick a biblical timeline here. It's really important that I just let you know how we are interpreting these thoughts. We interpret the Word of God from a literal, grammatical, historical, contextual and I always like to say Christological interpretation of God's divine revelation by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's really, really important as to how we arrive at these thoughts. And as we approach the second coming, it's really with a futuristic perspective. And we've talked about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. It was portrayed so great in um, o oh, glorious day, his first advent and coming, and all that that involved. And it ushered in the church age. And then we just spoke of the rapture or the outcalling of his church, us meeting him in the air, and other verses that <clears throat> emphasize that. But just a couple of thoughts post rapture and pre glorious second coming or, or his appearing. 
In heaven, what we will be doing is we will be a part of the bema or the judgment seat of Christ to reward believers according to their works that are done on the earth. Romans speaks of that. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, a very powerful thought for us and great impact upon our living. Also, we'll participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride of Christ that we talked about on Mother's Day, the Lamb of God. And on the earth during that time will be what is called the seven-year tribulation period. Jeremiah speaks of it, Daniel. Uh, also, uh, Second Thessalonians and most of Revelation is devoted to that time. So hopefully you can kind of be tracking along with me uh, as we move to these incredible thoughts. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. One man wrote in the New Testament, Jesus himself said 22 times he will physically come back to earth. And 50 times men are told to be ready for his bodily return. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. We will use this as our foundational verses, just as we used John 14, and then we'll have a few collaborating verses, and we'll climactically conclude. Incredibly, after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have this passage in Acts 1, and we mentioned it, so many times in verse 8 in its context here about receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and how crucial that is. But then look at verse 9. Now when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. An incredible thought. His ascension, but then a promise of his coming again to the earth. This is mentioned many times, his second coming in the Old Testament, uh, Daniel, Zechariah, but then so much in the New Testament, Matthew and Mark, Luke, Acts again, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Peter, Revelation. And as I said earlier, it seems each book, except for maybe three, seems to make an allusion to that. Zechariah, and you can just listen to this, 14 verses 1 to 4, and pointing towards this great thought and integrating it, says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And then he goes through some of the thoughts of the judgment and all those uh, things going on. And then in verse 3 it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of his battle. And then verse 4, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is the very place that he arose from, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. An incredible pointing to the second coming of the Lord Jesus to the earth. Matthew 24, and if you want to flip over there, Jesus begins to affirm these thoughts, and we'll see it in Matthew 24 and in 25. Verses 15 to 31 of Matthew 24 covers a lot of that. Jake had shared much on that as he was doing the study over the last several years of the last days. But in verse 24... I mean, chapter 24, excuse me. Um, in verse 27, it says, <clears throat> For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. 
And then 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then climactically, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then if you look in Matthew 25, in verse 31, again, all these thoughts integrating together. But then in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes, and I love how there's just this continual repetition of glory. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And then Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 7. An amazing thought. Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him. A contrast to the rapture, because this, every eye will see Him. They who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, amen. And then what I read earlier, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then if you'll flip to Revelation 19, this is an absolutely incredible climactic proclamation of this thought of His second coming. In verse 11 of chapter 19, I remember when I first became a Christian, just how these thoughts so enveloped me and how I just so looked forward to these incredible moments that were to come in the future. And he says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Remember when we talked about the glorified Christ? And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe that had been dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh are written, King of kings and Lord of of lords. What an amazing setting. What an amazing scene. All I could think about was the word awesome. If you sit and contemplate that for just a moment, that is awesome. Is it not, Paul McAndrew? That is awesome. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just a couple of distinctive qualities that I wanted to mention here is that it's not imminent as the rapture. There are certain signs and events that must occur. It is at least seven years off. Also, uh, some other thoughts here. It's a public event. We read that. Uh, everyone's going to see it. He will be returning with his bride to set up his 1,000-year millennial reign. How incredible is that to consider? It'll occur at the end of the tribulation period, and we will rule with Christ, and He actually comes back to the earth. And for those who are not believers, it will be a time of mourning because He will judge all of the nations. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. The Antichrist and the false prophet from Revelation 20 will be overthrown. Israel's covenants all their promises will be fulfilled, the seed, the blessing, the land. 
And amazingly, the millennial righteous messianic kingdom will be established and it will begin. Wow. Christ will occupy the throne of David and the earth will be characterized by harmony, by peace, righteousness, and true godly justice. I want to just to mention a couple of thoughts following that reign. Temporarily, Satan will be released. He'll deceive the nations, attempting to overthrow the Lamb, but he will be uh, defeated. I love what Martin Luther says. Anybody can say it? One little word shall fail him. And then we'll have the great white throne where it will be the judgment of those who are not believers, the unbelieving. They will be uh, sadly cast into the lake of fire, an eternal destiny of separation from God forever. And then when that's all said and done, we'll have the eternal state. New heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. What a future is ours. An eternal home in perfect fellowship with God and with one another forever. Just, I love that emphasis. Just to encourage us, I just had two thoughts. I loved Paul Harvey. Did you guys not? This is the rest of the story. And this just enables us to live with faith and hope and love that uh, just surpasses everything. You know, guys, I've told you guys that I can hardly watch a Virginia Tech football game because of not knowing who's going to win. So I love to tape them and then know who that Virginia Tech won. And then I love to watch the move, the, the, the video. And then when they have a turnover and my son doesn't know who's going to win, he's like, ah! Oh! I'm like, oh, it's okay. Because I know the end of the story. Are you living like you know the end of the story? Are we, guys? We need to be living because we do know the end of the story. And I did want to say one thing here that really uh, so much is on my heart. You know, guys, when we know what the future is for the unbelieving, I believe this is a motivation for us, is it not? To be participating through Christ and by the Spirit in the Great Commission. To be making disciples. For those who do not know Christ, proclaiming Him for justification, but also for believers who are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, to be encouraging them to live the life they have received. It's everything that prayerfully I do for us. And we're doing it in our living and, and doing it in our proclaiming. I guess we probably would be surprised by the opportunities that are out there for us in this day and this age. My dear Barb, Christ is going to be proclaimed on Saturday in a clear, accurate way. And I just pray that will mark us, each and every one, myself included, ever increasingly. I got great news. Christ is coming based upon the authority of Him and His Word eminently for us at the rapture of the church and then us with Him at His glorious appearing when He establishes His messianic earthly kingdom and then will be followed by the eternal state. How do we respond to this? We've kind of laced some of that in, but I just thought of spiritual coaching. Uh, first, just be looking unto Jesus. We've emphasized that throughout our time in the Word of God, in prayer, in our fellowship, and others who are manifesting Christ. Be looking unto Him. Be hoping in Him. Be one who somebody wants to ask, why are you so hopeful in these days? And you could say, I'm glad you ask. 
And then you can give an account for the hope that's within you. Christ, our hope of glory, Him in us. Third, be living by faith in Him and His promises. In particular, I would just say this, be alert, be awake, be aware, be anticipating His sure return for you at an unsure time. You know, when I was driving up today looking at the sun and I could hardly look, I was thinking, Lord, is today the day? Oh, I'm anticipating it. And I believe, beloved ones, it is drawing nigh. Faster and quicker than we probably could ever think, imagine, or dream. And then I want to say this. Be encouraging each other. Be hopeful. Be positive. Yeah, I know that it's hard. I know that there's all kinds of things. But when we put it in context, when we put it in the perspective, oh, are these troubles anything in the light of the glory that is to come and to be forever in the presence of the majestic glory, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul said these things to Titus, which is a great exclamation point for us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope, the rapture of the church, and glorious appearing, the second coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Behold, said the Lord Jesus, I am coming quickly. I am Alpha. I am Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. And I would say, even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, eternal and everlasting Father, we thank you for your incredible revelation of past and present and what is to come, but most importantly, who is to come and how we so look forward to the coming of Christ for us and the rapture of the church and the great promise that we will forever be with him. And we look forward with great anticipation to coming back with him to the earth, to reign with him, as he has said, for a thousand years, and then to proceed on into the eternal state. We ask that you would transform our lives by these truths as we live them now, and as we look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ for us, where we will behold him in his greatness and his glory. And we ask you to do these things in the name that's above every name, the name of the coming Christ, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray that you are looking forward to those incredible thoughts. Everybody stand up with me and we will be dismissed. Our Lord Jesus said, behold, I am coming quickly. And we can say to that, amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. So we're dismissed, everybody. Have a wonderful week and continue running the race, looking unto him, anticipating his return. We're dismissed, everybody.